off today. I don't think she's here. She's probably out there watching me, which makes me almost more nervous than <laughs> her sitting here. That's kind of creepy if I think about it. Oh, all this streaming stuff. Uh, I guess I, you know, kind of feel like the Beatles now. I mean, all those millions of people watching you on TV almost makes you feel a little more uncomfortable. <clears throat> it was better when they were just all watching you live. But uh, just in case, I'm Wally. Um, I'm filling in on the days when Heather can't be here or taking a day off. And being the substitute teacher is easier or sometimes harder. Um, today, it seems like it's a little harder. I was kind of excited today when I saw that my, my sermon was going to be on the fish and the bread being multiplied. I seemed like my last sermon was very difficult, and this one was going to be easy. Well, the more I got into it, um, it, you know, the easy ones seem a little bit harder. So I just wanted to welcome you all. We'll get in into that a little bit later. Um, is there anything that anybody would want to add today or any concerns that I could mention today to everybody or any announcements anybody would want to say this morning before we get started? Okay, so let us get into a... Uh, mentality of prayer and listen to the, I wanted to say, ghost musicians. When we first started this, we weren't going to have a musician because I'm up here and Jan was going to be away. Jan was able to be here after we set up the ghost musicians, which is going to be kind of also creepy for me because a little bit of this ghost musician is me. <laughs> so I'm going to be sitting here listening to me play. So it's going to be kind of one of those critical things where I'm going to be maybe cringing a little bit. So let us listen to the prelude. We are called to this place of worship to encounter 
presence and power of God through Jesus Christ. O oh God, you make us hearts strong when we are confronted with seemingly impossible tasks. When huge obstacles confront us, it seems easier to run away than to fight for what is right. Come gather us in this holy place, leaving our fears at the door. We stand strong and worship knowing God is at our side. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, open our eyes to all the possibilities your love and grace presents to us. Fill our lives with the gracious spirit of God's love. We thank you for your presence in this place and in our lives. Grant us wisdom to place our fears and worries in your hands and move forward with courage, trusting in you. Amen. Please rise as you are able. As we sing Break Thou the Bread of Life, we will sing with the video.
Okay. I am just going to go right in into the sermon here. I don't see too many children here, and I am just going to go right in here to the sermon. I don't have too much set up here for the children at this point anyway, and I apologize. Um, I couldn't find any stinky fish to bring for them. <laughs> Not that they'd want to see the stinky fish. And I was going to bring stinky fish for everyone else. That was, that was part of what I was going to do. Um, that's the first thing that came into my mind, was the stinky fish. I was going to go to hy V and buy. See, when I, when I read this sermon and studied it, that's the first thing that came to mind. Stinky fish. Uh, out of all the things that came to mind was all these years reading this, and now, you know, I'm 53, 54 years old. First thing that came to mind is, could that be really good for you? Here's this basket of two fish and five loaves of bread. The five loaves of bread were okay, but what about those two fish? That had to have been sitting out all day. Two fish, probably sardines, pickled, maybe pickled. Most likely sardines. I've got two cans of sardines in the, in the cupboard. They've been sitting there for uh, five years. I don't even want to think about opening them up. I don't know why they're still in there. Somebody bought them. <laughs> if we opened them up and didn't put them in the refrigerator and put them in a basket. Uh, anyway, you know, I know that was probably the thing back then. Did you refrigerate their fish? They didn't have refrigerators, okay? So I don't know. That was one of those things in the 80s, you know, Arsenio Hall, things that made you go, hmm. So... You know, that's one of those things, you know, last time I had a tough sermon, this one was supposed to be easy, and then the easy ones started to make me start out with things that made me go, hmm. So here we go. This all started out with the 12 disciples coming back from their journeys. Jesus had sent them out to go into the small towns to do some healing and teaching and they were all coming back to Jesus to tell them about their adventures to what they had done. And at the same time during this, this, these weeks, Jesus had heard that his friend John the Baptist had been killed and Jesus was kind of downtrodden about that and his disciples come back and they were in this wrestle and bustle and Jesus had wanted to take them to this deserted place to rest and to talk about what had happened. So they got in this boat, and we're going to go across the, the, the Sea of Galilee to this quiet place. And all these people saw them get in this boat, and they were floating across in this boat. And all the people saw them go across, and the sea wasn't that big. So they were floating in this boat, but the people could run faster. And here the people were running across, running around, and they could see them floating in this boat, and they were floating in this boat, and the people were running around. It's like, ah, they're going to catch us. So by the time they got to the other side, the people were already there. And the disciples were like, you know, here they are. We were trying to get to a quiet place. But Jesus, he saw them there, but Jesus had compassion on them. The disciples were kind of irritated with them, but Jesus saw them and had compassion on them and started to teach them. Well, this whole gospel was recorded in the four gospels. It's the only one that was recorded in the four besides the resurrection. It was recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the one I'm 
got written in here is John, the one that I'm and doing the sermon on is John, but it was recorded in all four, the only one besides the resurrection, which makes it kind of a big deal, and we have learned before that none of these were all, they all sat down at one time and wrote them. They're all written in different times, far apart from each other. Matthew 14, 13 to 23, written at a different time. When Jesus heard what had happened, she withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them, healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to the heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. He gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. Mark 6, 30 through 44. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran in by foot all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed, they saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him this remote place, they said, it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go get to the surrounding village, countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them? How many loaves do you have? He asked Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. The disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Luke 9, 10 through 17. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he, looked, then he took them with him, and they withdrew themselves to the town called Bethesda. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to their surrounding villages and countrysides and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place. He replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there, but he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down, taking the five loaves, the two fish, looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke them, 
Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. Now this is John, John 6, the one that, uh, the sermon that I'm, you know, actually using for the sermon. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and the great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up onto the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that were left over. Let nothing be left wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the signs Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come to the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, all of these had a couple of same things written in them. They all referred to the fish and the bread. All of them had the leftovers being 12. Now, comically, I've heard several times that that was 12 doggy bags for the disciples because they hadn't eaten either. Now, <laughs> whether that's true or not, um, that also I've heard referred to the 12 tribes of Israel. A lot of math was thrown out when I was researching this. The five loaves of bread and the two fish referred to, a lot of math was thrown out. And I don't like math. But this referred to this and this referred to that. And I also was referred to, this was the first tailgating party, and that everyone gathered around and shared what they had brought themselves. You know, this was, you know, during the Passover festival, and everybody had food with them, and it all ended up being that everybody just shared what they had already. And, you know, it, it all came down to who wanted to believe what. And over the years, it kind of, in modern times, has turned into something so simple, a miracle, turned into an argument of belief. How can something so simple as God standing by your side doing something and making something happen for you into something so that eh, doesn't really say anything. The people just did it. It wasn't God just, God didn't make this whole miraculous thing happen. The, the people made it happen. You know, Andrew just found some some kid with Long John Silver's two fish and five biscuits walking past and, and uh, you know, and then the rest of the people had bread in their, their pockets and passed it out amongst each other. And you know how it goes when you're at a, a tailgate, everybody has extra and they just shared with each other. But, you know, 
if it was written in all four, four, uh, four scriptures, something major did happen there. And if Jesus really wanted to be known for this, he would have let the crowds take him, put him up on his shoulder and carry him in to town and say, I am the king. I am who you say I am. Instead of, you know, wandering off and up into the mountains and not letting him do. He wasn't there to prove the point that I am the king, I am the Messiah. When the people started saying, this is the Messiah and I am, I am who you say I am, he, he, he wandered off up into the mountains. He said, no, I just performed this miracle for you. I fed you the bread of life. I didn't feed you the bread and the fish. You're missing the point. You're completely missing the point. Philip missed the point. Andrew missed the point. And the, and the scripture tells you that they missed the point. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. In John, he, he says Jesus knew what he was going to do. Here, Philip, the disciples knew who Jesus was. Jesus, they've seen what Jesus could do. And here, Philip is already contemplating numbers. He's, he's saying, I need all this money to buy this bread. I need this much money. He's, comp he's calculating He's calculating numbers. He's standing next to God, the Son of Man, the Son of God. But yet he, he, he already realizes he's standing next to God. He already realizes he's seen what, he's seen what Jesus can do. But he yet forgets that he's standing next to the Son of God. He's forgetting Exodus 16. 1 through 18, the whole Israeli community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month and had come out of Egypt in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if we only had died in the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate the food we wanted, but you've brought us out into this desert to starve to death. The Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough that day, and this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other day. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that this is the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because you will hear the grumbling against you, him. Who we are that you shall grumble against us. Moses also said you will know that it is the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard you grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us but against the Lord. He gave them all the meat they need and all the bread they need. For how long in the desert, even as they grumbled after they were taken out of captivity in Egypt. And here Philip is standing next to him, standing next to God with 5,000 if you had the women and children, 15,000, 20,000. With five loaves of bread, two fish, and saying, I need two years wage. I need, I need this much money. Yet he's standing next to God saying, how can we do this? And Jesus is probably standing there saying, mm-hmm, you know. You know, I know what I'm going to do. This is, a, this is a pop quiz. And, you know, I've sent you out with all this, 
you know, commissioning to go out and, and, and I gave you this commissioning to go out and heal. You've just gone out for two weeks and healed people and taught people. I've given you this commissioning and, and you've done it. I've given you this commissioning and you've done this stuff and you've taught people and you've come back and you were going to tell me how, how much you've done. And here now we've, we've come back, we've got these people here, and you need to feed them and now you're telling me we can't do it? Give me those five loaves of bread and two fish. I'll bless them. I'm going to give them to you, and you're going to do it. He didn't bless them and walk around and give it to the people. He gave it to the disciples, and again, the disciples did it. It was another teaching lesson for the disciples. The disciples were the ones that multiplied the bread and the fish. We are the ones that take the works of Jesus and multiply them to the world. Jesus takes what we have and gives them to the world and multiplies them to everybody. Anything plus Jesus is enough. Jesus blessed the loaves and the bread and the fish, gave them to the disciples, and took them out to the groups of the people. They filled 12 baskets of extra of the bread and the fish. Give us this day our daily bread. Miracles always start out with a mess. Miracles, no, you know, they don't start out with everything clean and tidy. If everything was clean and tidy, we wouldn't need a miracle. The story kind of gives us the message that it's not just about feeding the 5,000, the 15,000, the 20,000 of the breaking of the bread and blessing the bread. It's about Jesus standing next to us when we are in dire straits, when we're sitting there at the table and it doesn't just seem like we've got enough resources to cover whatever we need or lies before us. It could be feeding the 5,000 or it could be paying the 5,000 or it could be fixing the 5,000 shingles or it could be fixing the driveway or the car or the it, just some unsurmountable thing that we just can't do it. This seems like we've got this amount and this amount is what lies ahead of us. And we need a miracle to cover that. It shows us that if we do not factor in Jesus into the equation like Philip or Andrew or the disciples were that we can't do it and Jesus was testing the disciples in that he was testing them that are they going to do what I asked them to do there was in one of those Gospels, Jesus told them to go uh, have them, s break them up into groups of 50 and have them sit in groups of 50. Now, to me, you know, I read 
why did Jesus want to be sit in groups of 50? Well, someone, when I was reading about it, well, they were all in groups, you know, 10,000 people all together. Well, maybe that was to set them aside in groups to have them in a group of a community. 10,000 people wandering around in a desolate place. Set them in groups of community so they were safer. Maybe they were thinking of little groups of community so when they all did have to go back to wherever they came from, they were in a community, smaller community, so they were safer. Maybe that was the idea of setting them in groups. Maybe it was so it was easier to pass out the, uh, the bread to smaller groups. But can you imagine the disciples going around trying to group people into 50s, 10,000 people, 15,000. Have you worked with people before? Was Jesus testing the disciples to go out and have them do what he asked them to do? Can you imagine the disciples standing there and Jesus say, hey, go out there and, and group these people into groups of 50. And you see them standing there for a second, looking at each other and going, really? Groups of 50? Or 150? Okay. And Jesus going, okay, are you going to do what I tell you to do? Can you see Jesus sometimes being stern, looking at them, and maybe asking them to do these things to see if they're going to do it? Does Jesus sometimes... Seem like he's asking us to do things to see if we're going to do it. And if we follow. We can't factor out Jesus out of the equation of doing what we should be doing. And if we include Jesus... then things will work out. Maybe not for the way that we want it to work out. And maybe it won't seem like it works out. But in the long run, in the very end, maybe you'll look back And say, well, it didn't seem like in the beginning this was going to work out, but now I do see that this did work out. Not the way I wanted it to in the beginning, but I see that it did work out for the best. If we change things from a we process to a me process, leave Jesus out of the equation, try to do things on our own, then we're running into a major problem. If we didn't follow what Jesus' instructions were, if we just gave up and said, we can't feed these 5,000 people and sent them away. Then, then things would be a whole lot different than they are now. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, be with us as we go out into this week. There is much uncertainty and anger in this world. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, send down on those who hold public office in federal, state, and local governments. Give them wisdom and clarity and justice with that steadfast purpose they may serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all. 
bring peace and understanding. Be with those who are suffering with financial hardships and that may have no safe place to live or sleep at night. We pray for those who are sick and suffering, lonely or just need of your presence. And we ask that you would touch them with your healing and with your guidance, with your peace. Please hear us now as we lift the names of those for whom we ask your blessing in this time of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give your thanks and praise in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, saying the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Teachers love show and tell. <laughs> so I brought a prop. I'm so happy to be here today to share my story of my faith journey. My faith journey is a long one. I was raised going to church, Sunday school, and church dinners. But this story is about a very special part of that journey that shines as bright as a star. Bonnie was my cousin, and she began my real faith journey. And Don, after he passed away, my husband, cemented it for me. She was close to my age, and she had two brothers, no sisters, so we were like sisters. She and her brothers liked to come to our house to stay because we lived just four houses away from the community swimming pool, and that was fun. We liked to go to her house because they lived on a farm with all kinds of adventures, from playing in the hayloft to catching tadpoles in the creek. Just fun. When Bonnie would stay overnight with us, she slept with me and my older sister. Yes, three of us in one bed. It worked out fine when we finally quit talking for the night. She was accustomed to sleeping by herself and had the habit of spreading out. So we would tease her and beg and say, no frog legs tonight, please. Bonnie became ill in her early 20s. Hers was a case study in the Des Moines area for liver cancer, one of the first around here. At that time, her family was told that liver cancer was most common among middle-aged African-American men. Her parents took Bonnie everywhere to fight, try to find answers and an effective treatment. None of it worked, and none of it made any sense to us. I invited Bonnie to stay with me at college for a weekend. We talked late into the night and about everything. 
Both of us had been raised in a church, but we also had a healthy dose of skepticism, you know, those teenage years and whatever. I asked her if she thought there was really a heaven. I, I don't remember her answer, but we agreed that she would let me know that she was okay after she died. We were both so young and so naive, really. Some years later, after Bonnie had died, I was by myself in my apartment taking a nap, and I was really in that in-between I wasn't really awake and I wasn't really asleep. And she took a hold of my hand. She took a hold of my hand. My heart was about to beat out of my chest. I sat straight up in bed. That was when I could sit straight up in bed without help. I was scared. But once I calmed myself down, I knew. I knew in my heart and in my soul and without any shred of a doubt that it had been Bonnie. It was absolutely the first thought in my mind. Heaven was real. Heaven is real. This event opened my eyes to spirit, the spirituality of everything and the gifts and the wonderment of God. This is an album that Bonnie recorded before she died, and I'd like to read from the cover. The first one is a poem called, There Are Blessings in Everything. The author is unknown. Blessings come in many guises that God alone in love devises. And sickness, which we dread so much, can bring a very healing touch. For often on the wings of pain, the peace we sought before in vain will come to us with sweet surprise, for God is merciful and wise. And through long hours of tribulation, God gives us time for meditation. And no sickness can be counted loss that teaches us to bear our cross. The second part of her album that I want to um, just share with you is the dedication. And she dedicated this album to the true believers in Jesus Christ. I have been given a gift. The gift is the ability to see life and death as they find their true meanings. At the age of 20, I learned that I had terminal cancer. I thought that I didn't want to go on living. My prayers seemed endless. I prayed for healing, relief from pain, forgiveness of my sins, strength for my family and myself and at times, even to see the end of my life. My prayers were answered by giving me a new day. Each day was painful at first. Then I began to realize that I had never really lived. Each thing I saw or touched or did were all new gifts of life that are too often taken for granted. I'm not a saint. I'm just living one day at a time because my life still has a forever. Bonnie Johnson. Okay. Um, now we'll be in some thoughts about our offering. We have received many blessings from God. We give our finances, our talents, our time, and our service. Most of all, we give our hearts. 
we make our offering here and now to share the good news for those in need. Let us give our gifts to God in gratitude and praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless these gifts that have been received. These gifts are given in thanks and praise for what you have given to us. Help us to use them to spread the good news of your love and grace throughout the community. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. The story of Jesus with the bread and the fish and the 5,000 people, that's a story that's hard to imagine. Yet, the same reality comes to mind as we gather at our communion table around a simple loaf of bread and a small cup. Who can imagine that this fruit of the vine and the broken bread will satisfy the hearts of us all. As there was plenty for all that day, there is also abundance here today at this table. Come to this table and partake of the bread that satisfies every want and need. Come to the table that excludes no one and gives life to all. Dear Lord, nourish us through your life-giving presence. May our hearts be open as we raise our voices in grateful praise and stir our souls to a greater connection with the full body of Christ. Amen. In preparation for communion, we will sing Bread of Heaven by Brett Helsla. Bread of heaven 
On that night Jesus was betrayed, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples. As they normally would that night, they gathered for a Passover meal. But after that meal, he did something completely different. He took a piece of bread and he broke it. He passed it around and he said, this is my body broken for you. When you do this in remembrance of me, you do so to remember me as my broken body. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup, he poured it. He said, this is my, my blood poured for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Also do this in remembrance of me. The bread of hope and the cup of life. I didn't hear too many wrong notes on that one. <laughs> uh, how many uh, announcements? That's the problem with being the substitute teacher. Anybody that has announcements, please help me out. Go ahead and raise your hand. Any announcements that I need to mention or please stand up and mention anything coming up this next week that need to be spoken. I know there's something coming up July 4th. Games and fireworks happening anywhere, somewhere. I know the TV is going on out there. Please read the TV. I know there's dates of something happening out there. I tried to read the calendar, but I couldn't. I uh, don't have anything written down. July 4th, there's a potluck and games fireworks somewhere. Um, so please remember to read anything happening there on the TV. That's probably the best place to get any information you need out there in the fellowship hall. So it's been a pleasure being your substitute preacher this Sunday. Heather should be back next Sunday. Thank you all for this time and opportunity. And I will continue to be back behind the keyboard for you. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and sing our closing song up on the screen. Filled with the Holy 
evil blessing. Filled to the full and with the love of God in our hearts, go forth to serve and feed those in need. Until we meet again, may you be blessed. Amen. <laughs>